Salve a tutti ragazzi, quello che state per vedere è un podcast girato con Justin Jacobi, coach di Atleti Olympian, che è l'attuale coach sulla parte alimentare di integrazione di Andrea Munzi, con il quale stiamo lavorando insieme su Andrea. In questo podcast abbiamo toccato differenti argomenti, io e Justin chiacchieriamo tanto e quindi abbiamo detto, senti, perché non farlo davanti a una telecamera in un podcast, una bella chiacchierata, la condividiamo anche con voi. Quindi non prometto che il podcast sarà super preciso, però toccheremo alcuni punti circa la situazione attuale di Andrea, quelli che sono gli obiettivi che ci siamo posti per il futuro con Andrea stesso e nel mentre daremo alcune informazioni per quanto riguarda la gestione dell'allenamento, dell'alimentazione, alcune considerazioni di genere. Spero che il podcast vi piaccia, supportatelo con un like, iscrivendovi al canale e condividendolo sui social. Buon podcast a tutti quanti. I just wanted to be like uh a chit chat like a discussion nothing more because uh we we've been spending some uh information in uh on instagram and uh, talking about Muzi's situation and then keep talking about all different stuff and i said like i want to share it with my audience because yeah. uh just to give you the idea like uh, in italy the problem is uh, not a lot of people can speak english okay. so yeah. obviously a lot of the knowledge outside is like can't access in the country yeah. so people are, are kind of confused how is the real bodybuilding it's so crazy to think like and maybe this is like me being in like ignorant american because yeah. we just assume everybody speaks english yeah. and so now you're you're from the uk right you're english yeah yeah okay yeah, so yeah. you speak english so you know what i mean yeah. now granted your dialect is different than say um so some of my athletes that i've worked with that are like more london based Okay. So like the way they described it to me is like there's like they have people who speak like the queen and yeah, then yeah. they use this, they use this term and I'm not saying this in a derogatory way they say you have people who speak like farmers. Yeah 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 yeah. No no like, it's, it's um, not offense because my my accent is basically from Rome plus South Yorkshire where everybody has okay. like a, a cup of tea it trust. Yeah. I like, was super super close. So it's like super weird and I say people from London they say from London in it. <laughs> so, yeah, so right. Yeah, right. Really different, more <laughs> open. So they say like bulk, and everything is wide open when they talk. Right. Uh, and I've so, heard yeah. Liverpool is like a very specific accent as well. Like really, it's not an accent. Understand. It's a different language to me. Like uh, I, I've been training. <laughs> right, that's, that's exactly. I, I, I've been training with Nathan the Asha, and we spend Perfect like uh, two, two, three hours training, and he, he keeps talking. And then we came back, and I was in the car with the video maker, and I'm like. Uh, i didn't understand a single word. I was just, yes, yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I didn't understand a single word. So the video maker tried to explain me some of the stuff he's been going through, but it's another language. Absolutely. No, I know. <laughs> and like, so I've been to uh, Portugal and uh, Switzerland, and I was pleasantly surprised with how much English speaking there was in Switzerland. Now, there were obviously people who don't, you know, because they have three native languages. They have um swiss french which is their primary language and like one of my best friends kali i'm a dean kali is swiss so that oh I yeah i love there. her love her i went yeah, over there amazing. and visited her back when we were um you know working together and so she speaks french and english and her english it's amazing how people in different countries how they can pick up on languages so much faster than uh, americans like we do not learn languages easily You, you don't have to. That's our biggest fallacy, bro. Like yeah. amongst other things. But it's amazing to me how the European countries, everyone's bilingual, trilingual, like can speak multiple languages. So like she speaks German now. She speaks French. She speaks English. And when I went to Switzerland, I was shocked. It was probably like, a, it was over 50% of the people there spoke English and could like speak with me. You know, because yeah. I don't speak any French and like I would be polite and say bonjour and I can like and try just to be polite. Like, hey, I'm foreign. You know, I'm not from here. They can look at me and be like, that guy's American. Like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. I guess I have the red, white and blue just like draped over my shoulders. Yeah. But um, that was like really eye opening. And then even with Portugal, um, the little bit that I was there. I really didn't have any issues, which is, I was surprised because I was like, man, they speak Portuguese. That's like, so not the same as English. I was like, they're not going to be able to understand me. I'm going to get fucking lost. And nope, everybody was like, it was broken English, but it was enough for me to understand what they were saying yeah. and get around. 
Um, so anyway, so it, it when so working with Andrea, yeah, it's so eye opening to me that like he doesn't understand anything I say. Like, <laughs> no, I like think nothing. you just translate through Google and translate when you. I'm pretty sure that's what it is, and I I try and actually speak as like layman's terms as I can because of the fact that I know he's translating everything. Yeah. Um, which I I mean, hey, I I commend him for that. You know what I mean for doing the best that he can. Uh, because real, I mean, relatively, it's been relatively straightforward and easy for him. Like it hasn't. Oh, yeah. We haven't had like language barriers impacting our ability to work. Uh, the first time I sent him a voice message, he just messaged me back, like almost immediately saying, Hey coach, my English is really not good. He's like, can you just type out your answers? I was like, Hey, I understand. No problem. Cause if he's listening to it, he's going to be like, yeah, I don't know. Anything. I don't know anything. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's funny to me that Italy is like that because the other European countries, I feel like everybody does like speak a lot of languages like Spain, London, yeah. Uh, Swiss, like Switzerland, for a perfect example, like, yeah, they, they spoke so many languages. And then for in Italy, for them to have like English hasn't like really infiltrated the country to become almost like a second language. It's surprising. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, it's not like uh, the, the new generation can speak English uh, not really well. Um, the, the thing of uh, Italy, I think, is the culture like we have a really strong culture in everything like for example give you an example we are the best country in the world in uh, translating the the films like you you see a movie mm -hmm. and everything is in italian and the, the guys that put the voice on it uh, like voice overing i don't know the terms uh, in in english to be honest uh, yeah voiceover uh, yeah sometimes yeah, yeah, so we with the yeah not not just subtitles uh, basically just uh, using the italian voice over the actors oh yeah voiceover yep yeah voiceovering so there is a strong culture in voiceovering like uh, the people that do voiceover in in italy are really famous and they're really skilled to the point that they can uh, like creates a different impact in the movie just by okay. voiceovering and creating a more, like sometimes a more dramatic effect or something like that. So that's why we don't really need to understand uh, uh, English. And right. uh, to me, the, the main problem about these is that you, you, you need to rely on some other people like journalists or some other people in general to understand what's happening in the world. And the best example was during the, the lockdown. And I was mm. here in UK and people were just, just telling about the UK situation, England situation, because they read about articles, Italian articles. I, I was just typing back the UK articles and BBC stuff. Mm. And I was like, it's not like that. Why? Because you're relying on someone else that is translating for you and they can just mm. translate it wrong. And right, yeah, it's like the game of that, telephone. That, the story gets changed. Exactly, exactly. And that is the saying that it's happening with bodybuilding. So to give you an example, in this moment, there is a strong belief that American bodybuilding is a Ronnie Coleman bodybuilding where people like cheat all the movement, like super angry <laughs> bench wars. Like the people say, I like the American bodybuilding. Like they, they right. say it to me and they are attacking a lot of Andrea Muzi. Because, you know, with Andrea, we are we are like working uh, uh, to Very be more precise, yeah, more precise yeah. on uh, like the movement, the form and try the tempo at the beginning. We used to work in the tempo just before implementing some heavy compound lifting, blah, blah. Mm. And they are like uh, attacking him because he's not doing the American bodybuilding, the real bodybuilding. Right, yeah. Because the American bodybuilding is what you see like Ronnie Coleman is doing. <laughs> that's yes. the level in England, in, in Italy, sorry. That that's the level. That's the the, the environment. So that's okay. why I, I love to talk to you and to to, yeah. to have your knowledge in the channel. Just, now where where do you live now? Do you live in Italy? Oh no, 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 in UK, in Sheffield. You're still in the UK? Okay. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sheffield. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, with what, you know, from the training aspect, you know, and I, I give him, you know, I give Andrea like my, um, uh, my two cents here and there, usually it's through you. Um, and like, even so when we are doing his tempo work, that's to really just, in my opinion, like it's to nail movements. It's like, okay, we're installing this new movement. We're going to go back to control tempo, mind muscle connection, make sure that we have the movement perfected. The only way that like you can really get loose with anything. And I don't, I don't really ever use like 
like Ronnie Coleman and Branch Warren as examples because they're like the opposite of what I want my people to do. Um, but even like, just like, let's say continuous repetitions, I call it piston style. So like you have an engine, you have pistons that go in and out, right? So I want continuous tension, like not like do one rep and then come up to the top, yeah. one rep, come up to the top. And like, there's this pause in between. With Andrea, it's like he's so controlled. And even there was a period of time where I, I I talked to him just recently and I was like, hey man, just like, just attack like your sets, like a little more, like be aggressive, like let the animal out, like just go for broke on this set, not to break, not to be like, hey man, I want you to break form and just do opposite yeah. of what Ludo is saying. But it's like, like, let me see some aggression, you know, it's like, cause it seems so almost so effortless for him. And I think it's because he's so skilled. So like training is something that I view as like, it's a skill, right? So you have talent within bodybuilding and that's round muscle belly's ability to getting great contest shape. with you know, relatively like low effort, you know, like a Dexter Jackson always was shredded. That was a genetic gift. That's a talent where skill is crafted over thousands of hours of repetition. So like being a good trainer, meaning being proficient at lifting weights and training the, your body is a skill. So Andrea is at this level of skill that's so high from having worked with somebody who understands biomechanics, the loss of gravity, <laughs> like even simplistic stuff that you would think is common sense. But for some people, like you're mentioning, it's still not, it hasn't like gotten to them yet. It hasn't translated um, which is funny because like you go to Eastern Europe and you go to like Ukraine and Russia, bro, they own that weight, which is so interesting to see. It's like how different areas and like Australia is a good example, not an area that has like a ton of bodybuilding knowledge, if I'm being perfectly honest. You know, they've got Lee Priest that's came out of there and sure, Bev Francis was Australian originally, but like they both came to the States at some point. Jocelyn Ardowitz is really the only, but that's another good example of like a country that really hasn't had a ton of like breakthrough. And I feel like it's, and I have friends that are there actually, um, and athletes that are there. And like, I talk to them and the concepts that we're talking about is just wildly different than anything they've done before. So like, for example, I'm working with a uh, WBFF pro um, in men's physique. Okay. And he wants to, so he doesn't want to compete in that divot organization anymore. And he wants to go into try and compete in the IFBB. So in Australia, it's, it's all called IFBB. There's not like NPC and IFBB, like there is in the States, like the NPC. Oh, saving, is the Italy, saving Italy. Yeah. Yeah. It's all IFBB, yeah. but there's like amateur and pro, but it's yeah, still yeah, exactly. all, all called IFBB. Whereas in the States you have NPC, which is your amateurs. IFBB is your professional. It's very clear distinction. So anyway, he wants to compete in the IFBB now and go for his pro card. Um, and I'm like, okay, that's totally fine, man. Like, I think you have a pretty damn good physique. Like we bring up some areas, we do some things differently. You pose a little bit differently. And I think you can make a good run at this in men's physique. And when we laid out his diet, basically the first thing I do, and this is something we've talked about is I just wanted to see if we could get in better composition. So like, Hey, like I'm not really looking for a whole lot of weight loss, but I'm just trying to get you back in like bodybuilding shape. You know, cause like you kind of don't look like you're in bodybuilding shape right now. Yeah. I wouldn't even necessarily call this off season. It kind of just looks like nothing. And the concepts that we laid out, like we did a basic carb cycle, um, which is his baseline diet. I have him reduce calories on his rest days. And then, uh, he has a ultra high saturation or high day, whatever you want to call it, like very high carbohydrate. And that's the same process that I run with everyone. I'm a very basic carb cycler. That's how I like to do things. And I'll get aggressive with it to the point where like your baseline diet and your high day are like super far. Oh, yeah. That's, that's my size. Like thousands of calories difference. Yeah. So like if your baseline, and let's say you're in a, in a very big deficit towards the end of a prep uh, for a man, maybe you're at 2000 calories, maybe sub 2000, depending on the size of the man, yeah. but then your high day calories are like 4,500. So it's like, that's, a, that's in prep. Or yes. In prep. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. that would be like, a, that would be an example of like an extreme carb cycle yeah. and I'll run those high days, maybe two days in a row with no cardio, no fat burners. So like clenbuterol gets pulled, uh, even Yohimbi, uh, which is very common in the States, Yohimbi hydrochloride. Um, we use that a lot over here. Um, yeah. it's the reason why for anyone listening is because Yohimbi and clenbuterol are very synergistic. One is an alpha two. 
uh, agonist, one's a beta two agonist. They work very well together, creating this like really good environment for fat loss. So if you're not already pairing them together, like do so, it's very simple. Um, so we pull those out and then let them feed up. And the reason why is because those high days are used for glycogen replenishment. They're also used for dietary stress uh, relief. They're used for performance boosts in the gym, you know, because a high, a high carb day, if you're that high, like going from 2000 calories to say 4,500 as arbitrary numbers, that'll last you for two days. Yeah. Like that'll give you two days worth of performance boosts. You'll get a performance boost that same day, just from almost placebo effect. Yeah. And then, cause the food you eat today really isn't impacting you today. It's impacting you tomorrow. Exactly. And then, so then the next day you're getting that same performance impact. Um, but also too, like the other thing that I've used it for is for keeping metabolic function as high as possible. Right. So metabolic adaptation is very common. We know this. So like if I'm in a linear deficit and I'm not getting any refeeds at some point, I'm not going to be able to yeah. keep losing weight. I'm going to plateau. And then it's like, well, then what do you do? You just keep driving cardio up and, you know, calories down more fat burners, more drugs. Yeah. And then before you know it, you're like crash dieting. So the, this process that I'm using with Alan is something he's never experienced before. He's like, I don't even know what you're talking about carb cycling. And I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> like, and I'm, we're educating. He's a great guy. So I have no, I love educating, especially somebody who's got talent and just hasn't had the right guidance. Uh, but the point I was making with all of this is it's amazing the differences between styles of bodybuilding within different countries and also to the different looks that come from different countries. Oh, yeah. If we're being perfectly honest. Um, the Middle Eastern guys look different Absolutely. and not in a good way or a bad way, but they just look different. They're just different. You can, you can understand why they are Middle Eastern. They are, they are, now Every, you can see every, everywhere, like these guys in Italian, in Italian shows, they are coming. And to be honest, I'm impressed. Like starting with the skin. Oh shit. Is that golden yes. skin is amazing. I, it, they have the best quality skin absolutely uh, like a phil like a phil heath like skin the, exactly the perfect, exactly the perfect skin tone as far as color um it's paper thin uh like i work with uh mohammed and bobby um okay. 212 pro and uh he we're going to do his first prep together this season and he was in he went to the olympia in 2022 but didn't go to the olympia in 2023 um, I went to some of the shows that he was at. It's very impressive. Um, just need to be a little bit sharper, but the, the, the quality on this guy, oh, yeah, yeah. unbelievable. And you know what? They all weigh way less than what they look like they weigh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's They're why I'm impressed. huge for what they weigh. Absolutely. absolutely. Like massive. He is so much bigger than me and I weigh like 20 pounds more than him. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, right yeah. now. And he's in great shape. He's like for off season, he's in great shape. And we're still trying to actually add tissue. He won't even start prep, like dieting down probably until about six weeks, 16 weeks out because he's, he's in that great of shape, but the quality is just different. Impressive. You know, hot and tube on another great example. I mean, yeah. skin is usually paper thin. Absolutely. I mean, they look, they look like they're made out of fucking rocks. Like they're just, they look. That, that, hard. that happens every time. Like, uh, uh, last time I've been in Rome and, uh, there was this guy that actually won the pro car there, amateur guy. And was like waiting in. And then it was like uh mid uh like light heavyweight. And I was like, that's not possible. That, that's not possible. It can't be like <laughs> yeah, right. He was I was like, how is this guy? I, I don't know. I don't know how he can feel in a light heavyweight. But the weight weight was there, like he, he literally weight in front of me. And right. he ended up winning the and I think that's a huge part of bodybuilding, like uh, to be honest, in amateur shows, like to to be much much bigger than you, like you really are. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Like I mean, like use our previous Mister Olympia Hadi Chupan. Like he's not that heavy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he was a two twelver at one point, so I we mean, know that he's not that heavy. We have we have two the two last Mister Olympia like open yeah. Hadi and Derek. Previous they two used to be like two twelve. That that's and so, I'm, yeah, I'm so sure Derek's Derek's good Lewis, I, I had to say something also. Pointed with the right timing, like years ago, he could yeah. say something also. Flex Lewis, you know. Yeah, I mean, he could. I mean, I, 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 that's something that I wish that we all could have seen at some point is seeing Flex yeah. like just jump in an open show, even if it was just like 
the Tampa pro, like just like, cause yeah, he, yeah, 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 yeah. He used to live in, back when he was competing. So he used to live in Florida. It's like, dude, just like jump in the Tampa pro, like for the hell of it. Like, why not? Like, who cares? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not going to tarnish your legacy. You know, I mean, Sean was doing it. Sean Corita was doing it and yeah. he won a couple of them, you know, he didn't win all of them, but he won a couple of them. Yeah. yeah so yeah, it's yeah. like, that's, that, that's it. That's it. I don't know. Maybe it's just like, as a fan of bodybuilding, like I, work with a big roster. I've worked with a lot of people. I've put a ton of people on stage. I've been on stage, you know, 11 times myself. And it's like, I'm still a fan, man. Like I still want to see like my favorite bodybuilders compete more often. Cause Absolutely. I just want to look at I just want to look at them. Like, it's just like, it's what I love, man. Like I'm like, Hey, flexibles, you're that flexibles is the reason I started bodybuilding, you know, and I'm actually fortunate enough to uh, be able to say that he's a, an acquaintance of mine now. Um, yeah. You know, I wouldn't go as far as saying that we're friends, um, but enough that he recognizes me and shakes my hand and, you know, says, Hey, how you doing? Like what's been going on? And it's all through Matt Jansen. Obviously my connection with Matt has linked me up with, uh, flex enough times to be able to, you know, say hello and him recognize me, uh, which is cool. You're like idol of bodybuilding, like to like know who you are. Um, that was cool. Like that's, he's the guy that got me into bodybuilding when I stopped playing college football, you know, so I played American football in college. And, uh, then I kind of just like, I kind of really just lost my love for it after, you know, 15 consecutive seasons of football. And then the last six of them are, yeah, the last six, I stopped doing any other sports and I just did football and then training year round yeah. for football. I kind of got burned down on it. I just wanted something else to do. And bodybuilding was the next thing for me. I remember went going to a show to support one of my buddies back in my, one of my high school buddies. And, uh, then which high school in the States is before university. Um, and then I remember on my Instagram, I'm like scrolling and then I see this picture and I'm like, Whoa, what the hell? And it was him doing a lat spread, a back lat spread, you know? And like, and he, I mean, he like from the, his back itself, wasn't like his best body. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's the void. That's the void. Like, like, that's like back better, better poses. <laughs> that was, those were not his like knockout, like, Oh, I won the show. As soon as I turned around, like, no, <laughs> that wasn't Flex Lewis's career, but it was just such a crazy shot. I mean, he was just stri yeah. you know, he strided his triceps on a back lat spread. And it was just, everything looked nasty. And I was like, Holy fuck. And he was pale. He was really pale white skin like mine. And he's got red beard, yeah, yeah, like yeah. me. And I'm like, holy yeah. fuck, dude! Like, that's like, that's what yeah. I look like. <laughs> you can recognize, uh, like, I, I this, there is these, uh, uh, let's say, uh, these things with the pale guys that they look so so sharp just before the show, and after the time they lose something. Like you can see on yeah. effects, you can see Nancy Labrada, you can see on James Solinger that, by the way, is just. You, you really look like James Solich. It is impressive. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Like really, really impressive. You just, just look like him. And um, yeah, he also he also has this, uh, this, this thing that he looks so sharp just before the time and then he loses something. And he's uh, like, sometimes I, I, I was like, why don't just step on stage just, just to see the effect, step on stage without the time and see the sharpness. Around. Oh, I know, dude, I... For us really pale guys, like, you know, like a Flex Lewis, myself. Now, Flex somehow used to nail it, his color. His color was always spot on. I don't feel like Flex maybe really can lumped into that, like the color like washed him. Uh, but maybe like Evan Centipani though, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, because he's been on record on podcasts saying that as well. He was like, I hated the tan. He's like, I did all my guest poses with no tan on because yeah. you looked freakier. Yeah, yeah. You know, because exactly. until you're like super, like, peaked dry and like like stage ready body fat level you put that tan on and then get underneath the lights it's like unless you're like truthfully there you look off yeah. and it's like it doesn't look good and i totally agree with you man I, i've actually like never really loved my stage pictures yeah. it's like my like 100%. it's like my one week out five day out like until i Amazing. up until i <laughs> up until i put that tan on i'm like dude i look Shit. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, dude, this is insane. And you look crazy in the gym. It's just bananas. And then the tan comes on. You're like, oh, dude, like <laughs> not the same. Like, but you know, I actually, I heard, um, I remember, uh, my first bodybuilding coach was Chris Tuttle. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, super popular in the Northeast now lives in Texas. Great guy. love him to death. And, uh, he's good friends with Jose Raymond. And I was actually, I've been, you know, able to, you know, be meet Jose through Chris a couple of times and Jose and I were talking one time and he mentioned the same thing of like, uh, how they did their tans differently back in the day. Yeah. And he was like, Oh, we always washed it off. 
who was like, we would tan for several days. And he also talked about, and I remember Chris and him both saying the same thing. He's like, every layer of tan you get is another layer of skin you have. Yeah. And dude, that has stuck with me since back when I first was bodybuilding with Chris that I've like always thought of. I'm like, well, I got to be more shredded than I think I need to be because that tan comes on and it's a whole other layer of skin. Yeah. And it, it's like, well, that's, and people, I don't feel like fully grasp that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you yeah. gotta be like truly shredded. Like, cause that tan adds skin. Now the way that they, I remember him telling me this story <clears throat> just recently at dinner one night. And it was like, they used to tan every day for like, from like five days out. Like they put, they put some tan on and they, they tanned in like tanning beds too. So they'd be, they'd be like darker already, which I don't know. Like I don't do that. And I never have done that. And like, I, I didn't do it because I heard that tanning in the tanning beds can damage your skin and make yeah, it yeah. bad for you to accept the tan of the spray tan. And I'm like, okay, well, fuck it. You're like, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So they, he said that they would tan leading up to the show, like in a tanning bed and try and have a little bit of a base, but then they would actually get a base coat and they would just do that every day and wash it off every day. So then by the time that they actually get sprayed, they get sprayed like one time and then they're good to go. And they always would shower the morning of the show and get their top coat put on. Then they would shower after prejudging and get sprayed again before finals. So it's like, by that point, you've been sprayed, like yeah. you've had 10, but it's like the way he described it is it's in your skin. It's not on your skin. Yeah. Yeah. And I was gotcha, like, fuck gotcha. you. That makes so you much about sense. It, like, days before the show, you look better. Like with the tan mm -hmm. still on, the, the really light tan you have, you look actually better. I think yeah. the, the, the shots a week before the show, uh, after the show, sorry, is just better. Because you have a... Sometimes, yeah, because like you have, you have like, yeah, you've washed that tan off, but you're exactly. still dark or, yeah, exactly. you know, you have some color. And as long as you don't like blow through your rebound and whatnot, but like if you like keep it tight <laughs> after that show, then like you can be like, you can wake up and be like, yo, I look absolutely crazy. Yeah. I'm and not like that, like post show, like coach, look how crazy I look. We should have gone on stage like this. It's like, yeah, you've got eight pounds of water on your ass too there, brother. Yeah, like, exactly. You exactly. lost all of the striations you the baby, in your Yeah, you can see the glutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Dude, my, my legs, my arms, my chest have veins everywhere, dude. We should have done this. It's like, what's your glutes look like? What are your what's hands? Your ankle. Look? Ankle like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like, oh, you mean, oh, you mean you have edema? It's like, yeah, yeah, we totally yeah. should have done that. Anyway, that's just funny. So, uh, just uh, I have some questions for you because uh, a yeah. lot of uh, obviously Italian followers are asking, and uh, I feel I need to interrupt you. Sorry about that because we can chat like all no, day long. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so, I know we can talk for. I just, I just want to touch it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'd like <laughs> to in other podcasts, but I just want to touch uh, some some stuff that I know people want to know, like uh, sure. about Andrea. So yeah. we didn't really, uh, like, we, we are working in silence, obviously. Andrea is really focused on the work. Like, he has now a specific plan. And like as soon as we start, he said, like, uh, oh, shit, now I realize what professional coaching is. Because he, he have, like, all oh, your... Did he really plan. say that? Yeah. He did? Oh, nice. Yeah. You didn't know. I didn't. This is nice to hear. I because you know he and I don't have a ton of dialogue. Like again, okay, he okay. He doesn't speak English, so um, he answers back. He's always very polite and everything like that. He was just sick on Monday, so he like messaged me privately and was like, "Hey, coach, I'm going to send you a check in Wednesday. I've been sick," and I'm like, "Okay, buddy, that's no problem. Like whatnot. Like I'd love for us to get closer, but it's hard when there's you know." I don't yeah. speak Italian, you know. I learn I I I learn a couple words and I say them to him you and can I say think I get, pizza and stuff. Yeah, I think I get him to laugh a little bit and something. He's like, you know, he, I I joke around about pasta and olive oil and stuff like that. And yeah. he's like, oh, this is Italy, bro. We love olive oil. <laughs> exactly. So, but no, it's it's I'm glad to hear that. It makes me feel good. I appreciate that. Yeah, he, he loved that. And so so now at the moment he's really focused. So um just uh I want you to touch like uh what was your impression on Andrea? Like when he mm. arrived, like he's, uh, what you think he can achieve and what's your plan, our plan or your plan for Andrea's future, near future? Of course. Um, so, you know, like first things first, obviously like he's enormous. Like he's the, he's the heaviest and largest bodybuilder on my team. Um, but he could be the heaviest and largest bodybuilder on like 99% of coaches teams right now. You know, like he's truly one of the bigger bodybuilders out there. Uh, he's a true 300 pounder, um, you know, so we've been pushing hard, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm actually really not 
maxed out. Like he has room to see more growth in his plan as well as in his physique. <clears throat> I felt like I've always been impressed by him leading into uh, even this past season. Now, I remember in 2023 seeing him competing and wondering what was wrong because I remember I was looking at him and I was like, man, he's usually like him. And um, there's another, I think Andrea Presti is also Italian, right? Yeah. Okay. So both of those guys, I remember have always, in my opinion, had like similar looks in the sense of they're really conditioned and like grainy and like really hard and they're bigger guys. They like lack no muscle uh, from the front. They're like really dominant, like with big delts and chest and like Presti was doing his thing this year, but Andrea Muzzy wasn't, he, he, we weren't just, he, we weren't seeing the, the detail that we'd seen before. And I was super surprised. I was like, what's wrong? Like, why is he not like grainy and crispy condition? Like he usually is. And then obviously like having now worked with him, <clears throat> we figured out what was his gut health, you know? So he was probably not metabolizing things properly. He wasn't absorbing his nutrients when he showed me his diet that he was following uh, cause he started with me only like six weeks after a contest. He was like technically in his like reverse diet. Yeah. But when he would, I asked him, I was like, well, what were you dieting on? Like, well, how low was your food when you were dieting? And he showed it to me. And I was shocked that a guy of that size needed to eat that little. Like I, I was blown away. And my goal for him is to never have to do that again, because honestly, there's no way that a guy that big should ever have to eat that little. There's just no way the amount of muscle that he carries should be uh, requiring more. And for those that are listening, it was like a lot of like no carb meals and white fish. Like that was the majority of his diet. I think two meals had carbs and they weren't like, wasn't like it was a hundred, 200 grams of carbs in those two meals. It was like yeah. 30 to 40, like it was just remarkably low. So, and that was another reason why I felt like he probably wasn't able to get in the best shape last, in, uh, last competition season was metabolic function had just taken a dive because he was just running to the ground and he competed too many times. You know what I mean? Like I know yeah, he was I, trying to get back to the Olympia, but he competed too many times. 2022, I think, because uh, there, there was the point system. And yeah, uh, he, he went to the Olympia like in 2022. Nine times. Like he competed nine times in a season. Like he was competing uh, at a certain point, like every weekend all over the world, just to get enough point to, to go to the yeah. Olympia. And I admire so, that, but it's yeah, just think, too much on the body. Yeah, that, that's the so, point. I think you need you know, to like, know I think when you can only when do people... that for so long, especially if you're already it's you kind of already have to be like like super in shape and they're like really low stress preps. Um, like yeah, maybe like the 90s, early 2000s bodybuilders were like ripping off shows like that, like Kevin Lebroni, you know, and like Dexter Jackson, like you know what I mean? Those guys like like Kevin Lebroni was the winningest bodybuilder of all time until Dexter just passed him, but he only did like he won more shows than he lost like in his career. Yeah. So he wasn't like competing like nine times a year forever, but like he was doing, they were ripping off a lot of shows, but things were just different then. And I think that all of those guys were so genetically elite that they had like really low stress preps. And they also were able to truly be like full-time bodybuilders. You know what I mean? Where it was like just eat, sleep and train and they still had paychecks coming in <laughs> where it's like exactly. not like that anymore. So <clears throat> it's a whole different environment. So for us, common day bodybuilders, I don't think it's the right move, like three, four shows. And I'd say like, Hey, shut it down. I'm like, that's a lot. To be honest, what, what I always think is that, uh, I, the most hypertrophic and important thing for athletes is longevity. Uh, meaning that let's take an example, like, uh, they decide to do Olympia, no matter what. So they mm -hmm. compete for nine times in a row, whatever. And they finally get to the Olympia. Then, like, the athletes completely crashed. <clears throat> it was yeah. crashed for a whole year, 2023, and yep. he couldn't do anything. Now, he still crashed. So he's going to spend another year just to mm -hmm. be back on track. Yeah. And then start. So basically, that single year competing every time cost you two, three years of your career. Yeah, exactly. It set you back like two that, years. That's my point. You know, <clears throat> there is a certain point where we need to pull off because, and I think the main problem, I don't know about uh, America a lot or international level, but the main problem is that it's kind like coaches think, okay, I have these athletes. 
I have in front of me one or two years with him, then something is going to happen because I'm going to, yeah. to it's going to happen. I'm going to lose him because he wants right. to change this, that, blah, blah. So I'm going to push as much as possible to get as many results as possible in the time frame. I'm sure I can coach him. So that's right. like putting the flag on it. You know, you're, you know no, you're so right. You're so right okay. with what you're saying there. And that is, that is the unfortunate fallacy that a lot of us as professional coaches kind of fall within because you're like, you're trying to provide instant gratification to the athlete to keep them around for longer. Yeah. And that's the unfortunate norm now that we've gotten into where as a coach, you realize, Hey, my top level, high level athletes, I maybe have, like you said, one to two years max with them before I just become another coach that they work with. And that sucks, you know, I mean, like it sucks and it really changes in a, how you coach them and it affects your ability to truly coach them the best way for the athlete, as opposed to what's best for like you or your business. And like, I've always done things in my, whether it's, cause I, I have fallen on the sword so many times when it comes to my athletes, I'm going to do what's best for the athlete, especially right, if, when it comes down to coaching, like, and, and doing competitions, you know, like Tonio, for example, I wanted him to take this year off he had such a great rebound and he was like, dude, I have to do new do to do the New York pro. Like, I think he was getting some external pressures too. Um, but he came to me and was just like, can we please do this? And he's like, after the New York pro, like, I'll like, whatever you say goes, but like, I have to do this. And I was like, okay. Like if it's like really important to you, like, like mentally, emotionally, and like career wise, it's really important to you to do this show again, I will prep you for it. And yeah, we didn't really have much of an off season. We kind of had his rebound and then kind of went back into a prep. Um, but he stayed in such great shape and everything like that. It, it worked for that time period. Now we have a relationship that I think can last for a long time. And that's how I'm coaching him. It's like, I want to coach this guy for the next seven years, not for the next seven months. And same with Andrea. That was why when he reached out, uh, it, this was at this point, this was 2023 when he had, it was like yeah. towards the end of 2023 when he had, what we had talked about this conversation specifically was, well, I really would like to compete in 2024. And I said, no. And now I for those that. that don't know, Matt Jansen and I are in a group chat with Andrea. And that way I have Matt's eyes to be able to look things over as well, if needed. Matt will chime in every once in a while here and there. Uh, and that's more so for the athlete's peace of mind, as well as yeah. my peace of mind, knowing that we have a second set of eyes at any moment's notice, which is for all co for all coaches out there. I'm not too proud to say it. a second set of eyes. Very useful. Oh, at 100%, times. 100%. I have a couple. I have, you know, I have Matt. I have Dom Kuza. I've got Cameron Cheek, um, like our Camp Jansen coaches that, you know, I can send, send things into our group chat and say, hey, guys, what do you think about this guy? Oh, like, I love here's this. where here's where we're at. Here's what we've been doing. Like he's dropped. Here's the rate of loss. We're dropping about, you know, one and a half pounds a week. We're eight weeks out. Like, what do you guys think? Do you think we're, you know, on point here or like whatnot? And it's just because like, Hey, sometimes people have funky bodies, you know, yeah, like they look like they're holding body fat forever. And then all of a sudden, like they're like shredded overnight, but it's like four weeks out and they finally start to look shredded. It's like, that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. It's like, man, dude, you kind of look like shit until four weeks out. And then all of a sudden you look like. You need someone that can look at the picture, like the old picture with a bit, little bit of distance sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's why yes. it's important. Like, I, I love everything you said. Like, it, it's something that I think is really missing in Italy. Like, the first thing is that when Andrea said to me, like, uh, okay, so we, uh, uh, we just in the plan is to take, uh, he said to me to take the year off, uh, blah, blah. And that was exactly it what I said him before. So it was yeah, like, I know. Oh, totally. me, okay, that's your right. And it was like <laughs> sad because he, he has another voice, another coach telling me, telling him you can't compete. But I was like, Andrea, just think for a moment. You have a, a coach like Justin that can take advantage of having you in the team and just push you no matter what, what is going to happen. And he's telling you, let's do things properly. Like you, you, you need to understand how much this guy is trusting you and like trusting your 
what you can achieve, like mm-hmm. like I do. Like if I want to take a year back, a year off, and just work and do things properly, it's because I think we can achieve something there. So yeah. just understand these. And the other thing is the team stuff that I think is important. Like uh, it's in Italy, we don't have this culture. Like it's literally there. There is no one that works in team. Like we have some some kind of team. Like Presti has a team, and he has some stuff. But the most time is like uh, a cocky things like. Uh, Uh, You know, I am the coach. I know everything. I know how to do. And uh, this is my athletes, blah, blah. And it's it's like everyone against everyone. That's why there was this situation when as soon as Andrea started working with me and with you, he's been attacked like every day on social. And he was like, okay, I just need to do the other. Like he has this like pro approach. Like he received everything. Everything was so professional. And he said, Okay, I just need to to shut down my mind and just do the athlete now, and that really saves. Him. Like I didn't tell you that, but really say you really save him in that in that point of view because he has this like professional approach. And he said, "Okay, mm-hmm. now I feel I can do the athlete, like proper athletes. I'm not just because right. I think he always understand that it was like so, someone was taking advantage of him just for uh, business purposes, stuff like yeah. that, and." Uh, yeah, that's that's basically the the point with Andrea. But so he's going to take the year off. We're going to mm-hmm. like, I think we still need to get back on track because he has a lot of issues like uh, gut health. Yeah, and, I still think we're off. Markers. I don't think it's hundred percent either. No, no, no. He's not always there, but he's doing a great job uh, uh, training wise. Like the form is amazing. He's really focused on that. The the loads. Absolutely. We are we are progressing. Is is taking like a huge step? He is doing is uh, understand how to give feedback. So be coachable, because it mm-hmm. isn't not to be coachable. Before it was like just random. Sh- you've seen the diet. You seem like it was okay. Dieting down. You stop eating. You take these steroids. You take fat burners. You take uh, caber. You take uh, uh, AIs, and we go on stage. That's how things do. Uh, just before right. the yeah. just before the show, you do a cheat meal, and the job is done. That was <laughs> yeah. And that's rare. So uh, basically, now he's he's really focused and he's doing like he is really aware of what kind of feedback uh, you need to understand and yeah we'll coach yeah and he's he's getting better at that too because you know the, obviously nobody none of your listeners probably know how i do things but you know i have a very like long check-in form that my athletes fill out and like it kind of gets repetitive um at times it seems mundane but like that's bodybuilding guys like bodybuilding is repetition <laughs> it's pretty mundane for a period of time um With Andrea, what my plan actually is, is I like to go in waves. So like people use the word mesocycles. I don't like to use fancy words like that. I call them phases. So like right now he's in a growth phase. So we're pushing as much as we can, trying to drive up strength, body weight, muscularity, all things trying to drive them up. I'll drive the diet up as far as as I can, as long as composition's in a good place. And I'll progressively work his uh, PEDs up as well. Now, when he does his first clean out phase, I then also turn that into a health phase, as well as the fact that we will focus on gut health on that as well. So every time that he finishes a growth phase for this year, which will be basically every 16 to 20 weeks, so we'll do 16 to 20 week phases where we're pushing up and then probably six to eight weeks where we're kind of pulling back down and kind of basically at like maintenance. And then or even how many weeks, how many weeks down? Six to eight weeks, maybe okay, 10 at the longest. Okay. Yep. So like six to eight at, if I feel like we need to go an additional two, we'll go to 10. Um, my rule of thumb is like, so the old school rule was like time on equals time off. So if you're on for 10, tw- you know, 16 weeks, you're off for 16 weeks. That's not modern day bodybuilding anymore. No, I do half. So like, if I'm on for okay. 16 weeks, then my, I'm off for eight. eight. If I'm on for 20 weeks, then I'm off for 10. So it's a, it's a half. And I found great success with that. I've been Absolutely. able to clean up blood, been able to clean up blood work with that, been able to get people's composition in a better place before they start their next growth phase. <clears throat> so the reason why I do this is oh, do you say for, mini cut? You yeah, know? like a mini cut. Okay, 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 okay. Yep. We use the term mini cut, yeah, yeah. Lots. Yeah, mini cut, mini diet, you know what I mean? Whatever. Yeah. Um, so I pull calories down for number one is GI distress for yeah. you know, because it eating four to 500 grams of rice a meal is hard on your stomach after a while. It's just an abundance of food that your body has to then 
break down. It has to then store. Your pancreas has to work in overdrive, releasing insulin. And it just, it becomes a lot. So then I like to give our, our, our bodies a break. So I pull calories down a little bit. I will maybe bump up some cardio like output. So caloric output, a little bump up some cardio. Maybe implement some hit cardio sessions, even like I am right now with Andrea. And that's for training purposes to try and keep his his, his uh, lung capacity and cardio endurance like really high. And he's used to getting like really high outputs from it. So that way like a hard set of hack squats isn't like having him on the floor for 10 minutes. <laughs> But um, after he does his growth phase, he'll do another, he'll, he'll back, it, back it down. We pull the PEDs way down, uh, we pull the food aid way down, we bump up a little bit of output to get some cardio health going. And then we essentially allow his weight to come down and to clear some body fat and some water weight that he might be carrying. So we're trying to drop some inflammation at, at that time. We're trying to be focusing on health at that time, making sure his blood work is in a good place before we did the next growth phase. But also it's like a mini diet. So like if he drops... Let's say we pushed up, you know, 30 pounds in that growth phase. Well, if he drops, you know, anywhere between 10 to 15 during that health phase, well, then that's 10 to 15 pounds that was gained that that wasn't muscle. That was, you know, some body fat and some water weight. So we get him into a more sensitive place from a insulin sensitivity standpoint, as well as just being more sensitive to the food, which goes kind of hand in hand. And then when it's time, his composition has now improved. And then we're able to push the next growth phase up. This is how, in my opinion, we avoid like growth phase, like a perma bulk, like growth phase, you know, your body gains some body fat during your growth phase. You're in a caloric surplus. It's, it happens. This is how we avoid linearly gaining body fat and like spinning our wheels in our growth phases, not gaining a bunch of muscle, but just gaining fat. So I like to keep athletes as sensitive as possible. One of the things I learned from Matt Jansen was, Hey, keep him as tight as he can for as long as he can. He's like, yeah. everyone grows better when they're leaner. And I was like, yeah, there is a specific uh, sense. anabolic resistance up to a certain point because like body fat can create a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines and stuff like that. It can uh, destroy the insulin sensitivity all this kind of stuff creates like i always say like there is a kind of a battle between like the muscle tissue and the adipose tissue of who is going to take the caloric surplus and right. the more you are fat the more the adipose tissue keep going fat and there is like a specific term there is anabolic resistance where you can't really have more muscle protein synthesis and you can you can't add muscles just because right. the environment can't handle it so you can and what happened the people just at that point, they just, because a lot of time they, they feel like no more pump because of the insulin sensitivity, mm -hmm. they feel bloated and they start adding more carbs. Okay, I don't have pump. I add more carbs and add more carbs. And yeah. that, that's that's the worst case scenario for people. So And then they yeah. get to a point where they can't get a pump and they're, exactly. they're, like, they're like overly out of shape. Exactly. And then their training performance comes. So they're, they're no longer getting stronger. They're not getting good pumps in the gym. Their sleep is probably wrecked from being so heavy. Their Absolutely. insulin resistance has gone to shit. And then it's like, well, guys, it's like, what are we doing then? Like, just diet exactly. down a little bit. Add some cardio in, clean up the diet, cut out some cheat Absolutely. meals for a month or two and pull some carbohydrates down. You'll be fine. 100%. You know, so that's, um, so, you know, that's how I like to do things. So Andre is going to get the whole shebang uh, when he finishes his first, uh, you know, his growth phase, which we're getting close to the yeah. end here because yeah, yeah. he's kind of plateauing now uh, in his food. And like I said, his food and his PEDs do have room to go, um, but we're also doing, uh, trying to clean up uh, his backside. And um, so with the, the use of the Accutane and stuff, you know, I don't want to be too aggressive. Um yeah. And, you know, like we're not using any orals or anything like that for the sake of uh, his health because Accutane is kind of harsh on the liver, yeah. um, but it also dries out some joints. So we're using, you know, certain compounds to try and make sure that his joints are staying yeah. well lubricated. Um, that was actually something that I had already known that that would be the effect, but I got a message, to, you know, privately from uh, Matt Jansen. He was like, that was really smart. He's like, that's exactly what I would have done. And I was like, perfect. So Andrea is coming up on his first end. Uh, which will be perfect because it'll be good for him to, you know, take a break um, from the pets, take a break from the food, um, you know, improve on his composition a bit. Um, but I remember seeing, so I remember he posted some throwback pictures and I remember him telling me this of like, cause he's been over 300 pounds before, but it was like sloppy. 
And I remember him telling me uh, this, he's like, this is the best I've ever looked at this weight. And, um, and I was impressed because I was happy to hear him say that because by my standard, he was still a little softer than I would like, but, and that's just my standards. You know, everyone has yeah, their own yeah, standards. Yeah. So he's still a little softer than I would like, but if he's telling me that this is the best he's ever looked at this weight, then that tells me two things. One, he's a hell of a lot leaner at this weight than he ever was before, which as a result, he's a lot more muscular at this weight yeah. than he ever was before. So you have both of those things going for you. Um, and that's, you know, something I'm really excited about. He'll be the biggest body I ever put on stage when we diet down for his, uh, contests, uh, you know, next season, whenever this, you know, we'll wait, I'm not in a rush to do anything with him, but we'll yeah. wait until the schedule comes out and see what European shows there, uh, we have options for. Um, but I'm excited. It's going to be good. And he's a great guy and I want to see him be successful because of all of the shit that he's had to deal with and endure since, you know, like trying to go out on his own and like expand his bodybuilding yeah. career outside of the country of Italy. And, uh, and he, you know, he deserves it. He's putting in the work, he's doing all the right things. So, you know, and, and we love having him on camp Jansen, you know, he's another good addition to our team and one that we want to see, like we want, he's an Olympian, you know what I mean? So like, he's a guy that should be going to the Olympia every year. Yeah. So, and if he has to do a couple of shows to get there, then so be it, you know, if, I'll let him compete three times next year if he wants to. And if that's what it takes us to get to the Olympia, okay, great. And then we take a break. And then, you know, when it's time to prepare for the Olympia, we start preparation. But he gets a break. The whole the point is to not – don't run your athletes into the ground to get the Olympia qualification and then have them yeah. look like shit at the Olympia because they're tired. Absolutely. Dude, it happens absolutely. every year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's a great it mistake. happens it happens in the, the divisions that have the most amount of athletes too yeah yeah like you figure bikini classic physique men's physique it's like yeah. there's only like 15 guys in those classes that are even like competitive probably yeah yeah that's probably, then like 16 no, through 50 level. yeah 16 through 50 are all like judges tired though <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah just making it's tyler like, more yeah, tired everyone's tired like oh that's the eighth call out of people yeah, it's like all right not in a dis disrespectful way obviously no there's yeah, not no disrespect, yeah, no yeah, disrespect yeah, 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 yeah. but the olympia is an exclusive club and like yeah. i mean i think that it really should be the top 20 in every division yeah. bring the top 20 in the div in each division each season and leave it at that yeah. you know we don't need 50 classic physique guys 50 men's physique guys 50 bikini yeah. girls you know, 45 figure girls. It's like no disrespect to any of those classes. I coach no, a lot no, of those. No, people. no, 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 got, 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 got. <laughs> But it's just, it's just because, you know, it's just too many. Um, yeah. It's the Olympia is about exclusivity. Absolutely. So. Let me ask you something like uh, um, just to have some, uh, uh, to give some ideas to the people that is following. I, I've seen uh, some really, uh, some, some stuff that I really appreciated on the diet. And the first one was, uh, you put from beginning like fruit, like mm -hmm. strawberries, yeah. blueberries. Uh, th that's not common. I, I think you're like, uh, yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> it's, it's super not, common it's over here. It's like, <laughs> oh, you can't eat fruit. You're a bodybuilder. That that's the kind of uh, uh, things people say. Like, I, I'm a huge fan of fruits, like uh, all around the diet, and especially during also the contest prep. Because I've yeah. always seen like in contest prep, people are like, okay, that's contest prep. I just cut everything and just eat uh, rice, yeah. uh, chicken. chicken and rice. Chicken and, and rice. then you Fish can't go rice. to the bathroom anymore. You can't go to the toilet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. the point. And yeah, I then always say, like, to hell and it's like you, man, what the hell's happening? Yeah. Are you going to the toilet properly? Yes. Then don't change anything about the like, obviously, you create the deficit and blah, 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 but don't change yeah. the food sources. So that's, that's something I really like. And coming to um, the, the, that blasting phase and yeah. that's the last thing that I, I let you go just what's your approach in in terms of uh, macros ratio so i've seen you don't push like a hell of high protein i've mm. seen uh like a moderate amount of fat like in every meal yeah. and yeah. You, you like like coconut oil and yes. uh yeah and also moderate amount of uh yeah also carbs so with Andrea and like, so just speaking on, on, on Andrea, cause he's probably the only diet of mine that you've seen. So I'm using coconut oil with him specifically because it's an antimicrobial yeah. and yeah. he needs as much of that in his gut health as possible to try and kill off the bad bacterial overgrowth yeah. that he's dealing with. I actually had a, when he got his results from his, uh, from his 
test. I think he did a GI map. It was something like that. They, Italy's equivalent to a GI map. And um, I got a second opinion over here in the States. And he, they basically told me, oh, yeah, he needs a full full protocol. Yeah. And then, you know, we went through that. Now, he had a physician in Italy treating it, which we looked over the protocol. And I had my second, my our team educator, Dom Cusa, review that. And he was like, yeah, this looks legitimate. He was like, this is, you know, right on point with what he needs. And I was like, okay, then perfect. Um, so the coconut oil for him is for gut purposes. It's for health, like gut health with fruits though. Like I think berries, especially blueberries are like some of the best foods that you can eat. They're super high in antioxidants, uh, which pe people don't know what antioxidants do. They have, from a cardiovascular health standpoint, antioxidants help push plaque through. So they actually help the breakdown of plaque. Um, and, you know, there's a host of other reasons for antioxidants, but just keeping the vast amount of micronutrients that we kind of overlook in bodybuilding from a fruit standpoint, because I'm not really big on greens. So like, if you've noticed that I don't really have any greens in his plant and it makes sense if he's having digestive issues, me adding a bunch of greens to his plan, which can sometimes be difficult to digest would be more distress. Uh, the fruits, however, however, uh, fructose, the sugar that's in found in fruit, uh, one of the easiest and most readily available carb sources that we can have. Um, it is uh, very well tolerated as far as digestion goes, not just fructose, but the, you know, the whole, the fruit in itself. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are some fruits that some people have issues with, say apples, for example, some people just eat an apple. And because of the fact that it has sorbitol and, it, and some fiber in it, it causes bloating for them. Okay, well, then that might not be a fruit that I use with them. The common fruits that I like to use would be berries. Um, and I don't mind which strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. Um, usually everybody kind of just buys that, that in our grocery stores, they buy the frozen bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have it. One thing, yeah, we have if you have the same, so then you just kind of weigh out your berries and call it a day. That's it. Um, I love using bananas. Um, and then a big one that I use is pineapple. So when I have higher fat meals, like red meat, for example, I like using pineapple with those meals. Um, now, a lot of people eat them all in one bowl, which to me is disgusting, but you, you like, to like, eating a, like, like having a bite of beef <laughs> and pineapple in my mouth at the same time, I'd be like, oh, <laughs> but they do it, whatever. But the whole purpose behind that is so um, pineapple's high in bromelain. Bromelain is a digestive enzyme that actually helps break down uh, fatty acids. So pairing it with a fattier meal, like a red meat meal, makes a lot of sense to me logistically. So that's why I've done that. And I've been doing that for a very long time. Um, I honestly will keep fruits in as long as I can. Um, you know, I will typically re reduce fats first when I'm starting to pull somebody down. Um, and then when you talked about protein, I don't think that you have to go crazy on this. We know that carbohydrates are protein sparing. Yeah. And we know that if you are also somebody who uses like EAAs, for example, like intra training, well, then you're getting plenty of you, you might, you might, honestly, you're probably eating, everybody's probably eating adequate enough protein amounts that they don't need EAAs intra training. Yeah. Like they have plenty of essential aminos floating through their bloodstream at yeah. any given time. Like if you've ate protein in the last two hours, you're fine. Yeah. So Absolutely. anyway, but it's just like not something that I feel like needs to go crazy on it. And I also just know that I've, my eyes have been opened a lot more the last three years or so to digestive health issues that are very common in bodybuilding that we all kind of equate to being normal. And then you fix it and then you realize how good you can feel. And then really like realizing what you used to feel like was anything but normal. So protein, like really high protein diets, meaning like cooked protein. So like meats. Like somebody Andrea's size, you would think is eating nine to 10 ounces of protein per meal. Not the case. It's just, he's not eating that much. There's no need, you know, he's getting an adequate amount of protein in for his relative muscularity. And that's the way I look at things. You know, he doesn't at, you know, at where he's at now. So he's about 308 pounds the last time that he sent me a check-in. So if he's, I'm doing yeah. some math here. So if he's 308 pounds and you go anywhere between 1.25 and 1.5 pound, a 1.5 grams of protein per body weight, 1.25 times his body weight would be 385. Well, he's definitely clearing 385. Now, is he at 
Probably not. I don't think he's eating 462 grams of protein. No, Do I have the exact breakdown macros wise of what his plan is right now in front of me? No. Um, but he's definitely do, over that. Sorry, do you consider the macros or do you just look at the diet? Cause that's, I can look at the, I, at the, I used to do like really, really like calculated macros now. And I don't need to do that anymore. That's, that's uh, I, can about, I always say to people like, uh, uh some people like, have. They oh, they have, ask all the time. Uh, yeah. Cause they have an impression like professional, like they, they, to be, they watch like YouTube videos where you have Chris Bam said, I don't these guys that just show the macros. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I think they're going to do this just for the purpose of the video, just to showing stuff. Yeah. But in my experience, like professional athletes and coach, just look at the diet and just think on the diets, on the amount of food. Not, okay, I need to add X amount of carbs when I'm going to do. Just look at the diet where I have more room to push carbs. How's mm -hmm. the protein and blah, blah, blah. I think that's, I mean, I work that way. That's how I do it. I, I let logic make a lot of the decisions for me. And common sense. That's it. That's I, it. I try and coach with my eyes and my brain as opposed to my outside influences. So, or, or fitting into this mold of like, oh, two grams of, you know, men need two grams of protein per pound of body weight. Okay. Then that means that Andre would need to eat 600 grams of protein a day. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Come on. That's 2,400 calories of protein. Yeah. Guys, yeah. we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah. Open pros aren't doing that. I can promise you this, you know what I mean? Maybe some old school guys, but Hadi, Hani Rambad is not having Hadi Chupan eat 600 grams of protein. He's also not having Derek eat 600 grams of protein. Let me just, let me just debunk that myth right now. I don't need to look at their plan to know that that's not what they're doing. Yeah. So, but with, on, with, at, at, with where I'm at now too, and it's also the numbers are very arbitrary and unfortunately people attach emotion to different numbers. They're like, well, I'm eating 5,000 calories, you know, so I'm, 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 I'm big. And it's like, who cares, dude? Like, you know, John Jewett made a really good point the other day. He's like, do you want to have to eat 6,000 calories to gain muscle? Wouldn't it be nice to gain muscle on 4,000 calories? Yeah. I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like, shoot, I'll take the 2,000 less calories. Are you kidding me? But so people don't really realize how stressful it is to eat incredibly hard on your body to eat that much. it's the most stressful thing like dieting down is just a walk on the on the fucking beach oh that's everyone looks forward season to season force feeding like it's yeah, not every enjoyable bodybuilder that has to force feed to gain muscle which um you know another thing i talked to matt about recently was just how difficult it is to be an open pro yeah i mean you want an olympia level open pro i mean you've got to you've got to be obsessed with it yeah. Because the amount of food that you have to eat and the, the timing and the scheduling of your eating is truly the biggest part of your day. Um, the training is the easy part, you know, and then dieting down shit, man, these big guys, they're like, can't wait to diet down. Cause they're like, dude, I can't stand eating this much. Yeah. You know, they like, can't wait, you know? And I commonly have athletes take, tell me that when I give them their high carb days, you know, they, you know, they're like comfortable at 2,500 calories. Then I go, all right, high carb day today. And they're like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's well, like, again, Justin, it, please. It used to be the other way. They used to be like, thank you. Give me food. And it's like, fuck, Justin, dude, I cannot eat 5,500 calories today. <laughs> but it's like, yo, dude, that's like putting gasoline on a fire. Just go. Yeah. And then good stuff happens. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't need to calculate anymore. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I didn't calculate anything with Tonyo. And look at what he did at the Olympia, yeah. you know, and I'm not calculating anything with him now. I haven't, I've never, I haven't pulled out a, an Excel spreadsheet and done math and calculations with a, a ratio of how much protein to carbs, to fats that I need to do in so many years. Now I will say that is an incredibly useful tool for the beginning of your bodybuilding. So you know, when did you start coaching? Uh, about eight years ago, something like that. And when you first started, you probably like tracked yeah, everything. Was, yeah, and yeah. It was very when I started, it was like the big boom of evidence-based approach. Okay. That was the okay. first in line talking about uh, resistance profile, line of pool, and um, stuff like uh, air, reps in reserve and all this kind oh, of yeah. stuff. And mm. uh, like my blessing was that uh, I also trained in a really great gym in Rome that where 
there was like all the golden era, era bodybuilders in in Rome, basically. There was okay. like Filippo Massaroni, Stefano Greco, all guys that used to bodybuild in America. And yeah. uh, like I remember, I I used to do all this kind of calculus and stuff like that, reps in reserve. Okay, I have to do, this is the right amount of volume. Yeah, blah, don't want to do too much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I can't recover. Blah blah. And then, uh, like these these famous bodybuilder like Stefano Greco, he coached me, and he took me on a. Oh, like I know a, that name. I know that name. Yes. I know that name. I, I don't know a lot of them, but I know that one. Yeah, yeah, Greco. yeah. Oh, it's the last yeah, yeah, yeah. name, Greco. I know that name. He's amazing. He's amazing. Like he was. I I think cool. uh, he will be like a great five first five, uh, top five classic Olympia at the moment because his physique was amazing, really. Yeah, and yeah, very cool. he took me on a leg day. And after that, like day, I was like with, with my wife. I looked at my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time, but I looked <laughs> at her and I said, "Shit, I didn't understand anything about bodybuilding." And I was shocked. And I, I, I've been like depressed, like really, really depressed for a whole week, trying to understand if I want to do this. And from then, like intensity style, real bodybuilding, intensity bodybuilding has been my my way, my path. That's why yeah. why I'm known in Italy because I I, I find the best of both worlds. Like uh, I have this week when I need to find okay I, I can't have like oh bro versus evidence base. I can keep something from the evidence base, but keep training with a lot of effort and intensity. So trying yeah. to find the best of both worlds. So that's that's basically the story. But at the beginning yeah. it was obviously all macros and calculus and all this stuff. Everything calculated. Yeah. Everything's super calculated. And and I think that the point that I was making with that was it's it's essential to kind of start that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, it's it's with anything, bodybuilding is one of the purest forms of hey, you gotta earn your stripes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you put in the time and effort to do like to to learn and to calculate yeah. and to find different ratios and whatnot. Okay, that's totally great. And I love that because I love that you're passionate about it. And all all I love about it is that hey, you're learning. You're educated now. You know how to track things. You Absolutely. know how to calculate some things. So that way you can interpret what I'm saying very easily and on a high level. Now, one thing that I truly believe, and I think a lot of bodybuilders will believe this, is the coaches at the top of the game are not overcomplicating things. It's really simple. You know, Hani is not an overcomplicated coach. You know, his FST7 seems maybe a little complex at first, but it's like, yeah. No, it's just progressive overload. And it's just a difference. It's he's just doing it a little differently. And it's like, no, it's still he's still progressive overload based. He loves he loves training heavy. Those guys are training, yeah. those guys train heavy. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, did you see the this past this and anybody didn't see this, but going into the Olympia, Adi Chupan was doing was was filming filming sets of him squatting six plates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, like I don't know if anybody can comprehend that, but a 585 pound barbell squat for sets of 10 to 12 is massively impressive yeah. that's why you have that's why he has mr olympia quality legs you know yeah. and like yeah. i'm sure hottie is telling uh i'm sure honey is telling him how he wants some training he's not just letting him do whatever you know he's awesome. very involved awesome. um you know even let's go back to the ronnie coleman days uh and even the jay color days you know jay color worked with um chris Aceto for a long time then he worked with honey and then you know uh ronnie always worked with um Shit, I'm I'm drawing a blank on what his uh, name Chad is. Nichols. Uh, Chad Nichols. Chad Nichols, yeah, Mayhem Muscle. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so Chad, he's a high protein guy, very simplistic, very basic. So like maybe some of his methods I'm not using anymore, but like, dude, he would he he was very brass text. Chicken and potato, egg whites, a couple whole eggs, grits, so easy to digest carbs. Uh, and he would trust me, Chad Nichols was not doing ratios of macros. Yeah. And yes, I know Ronnie Coleman's a bad example because he's the best that he's the best to ever do it. And he's got, you know, world-class easy, genetic. Easy work. But, it, but guys, the, the point of the matter is, is that like, you know, Matt Jansen, um, Hani Chup or uh, Hani Rambod, um, even, you know, Chris Aceto, maybe back in the day, George Farah back in the day, um, <clears throat> you know, even, you know, Oscar Ardon, any of these guys that were like, you know, really high level coaches at different periods of time are not over complicating things they keep it really simple 
Don't you know, so. Andrew Wu keeps things simple. Ariel Cutts keeps things simple. These are maybe guys currently that are at the highest level. You know, Andrew Wu coaches, um, you know, uh, Jessica Padilla number two in the world figure. And he coaches Natalia Kalejo, you know, previous Miss Olympia, now number two in the world. You know, like you got two number twos in the world. You're doing something right. So it's like, and I know Andrew Vu, and he's a buddy of mine, and I have a ton of respect for him. He's very simple, it, and it works. And like I've learned everything that I know about bodybuilding through from Chris Tuttle and Matt Jansen, and I can promise you that both of those guys kept things really simple. My diets for my shows are very, ba- very basic, very transparent, very, very easy to follow. My plans that I write, as you've read, very transparent, very simple, very yeah. easy to follow. Yeah. You know, a lot of basic bodybuilding foods with a little bit of variety to make sure that we can try and keep digestion in a good place. And it, at, when it comes to the training, which with Andrea, you do that aspect of it, but I like to chime in here and there because I love training. And that's the part that really got me into coaching was I love training. Just high effort guys, like just high levels of high effort and high output is going to yield a high quality physique. Yeah. I, I don't know a lot of Mr. Olympia's doing or Miss Olympia's both men and women doing RPE seven and, you know, with a three RIR on this set and, you know, worrying about overtraining. I know a lot that have really uh, proficient uh, fatigue management skills. And that's something that a good contest prep coach will do. And that's where pulling cardio out for some refeed days, maybe doing a four to five day diet break where you bring them out of a deficit and into uh, maintenance or even the tiniest of surplus and you reduce cardio, reduce fat. So there's things that as a coach you can do to manage fatigue. That's all well and good. But like when it's time to work, we go into the gym and it's like, Hey, I'm going for broke. Now I'm not married to the idea of a log book because I learned progressive overload from Dante Trudell. Yeah. So if anybody that doesn't know, Dante Trudell, creator of dog crap, DC training, uh, they know, they know. kind of like one of the OG, he kind of brought progressive overload yeah. back yeah. because we lost it. You know, we had it with Mike Menser for a little while, then we lost it. Then it kind of came back with Dorian. Yeah. And then it was like, kind of like Chad Nickel or sorry. Then it was kind of like, you know, Dante's like style really brought it kind of back, you know, and like, don't get me wrong, like high intensity trainers have always existed, but it wasn't popularized. Yeah. And it was a lot of high volume, like, like more Jay Cutler style of training. Like he never like trained super duper heavy, super duper high intensity. Um, but he like had mind muscle connection and volume that was high and he just, and he grew from it, which is great. That doesn't matter. You can grow a lot of different ways. But the style of training that I like, which for the Italian listeners, that's like more American is progressive overload under control. Like everything always has to be under control. So it's, there's just a, there's just a difference in how things have evolved, you know, because bodybuilding is a sport of evolution. You know, you evolve every year, your training evolves, the nutrition evolves, your PED protocols evolve. Absolutely. And that's, that's the point of the, that's the whole point of the sport. It's progression. You, you touched something I think is really important. I was talking with a, a guy on my team and I was like, people have this kind of idea that like top coaches, they know something and there is yeah. some yeah. secrets. That's why they, they look for some weird stuff and they overcomplicate th- stuff. I think that the ability of Matt, yours or Henny, well, all the co- top coaches is just not to overcomplicate things, but just to do the right things at the right time. So I look at the athlete. I know now is the time to refeed, or now is the time to push more, or to push. Stop. Yeah. Don't, they, or, or also to don't do anything. Just yeah, don't change anything. Just don't change going. anything. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I think that's why the experience and some having some data and having a coach uh, an athlete that is coachable and gives you right feedback and not just i have a lot of guys that like doing the perp oh i'm empty i'm empty i'm flat i'm empty i'm flat i'm not going to give you refeed okay so just give me yeah. right feedback you're not flat fuck you have a pump i can see the pump <laughs> you just yeah, want right. to feed. yeah just just stop complaining just give some feedback so i think <laughs> uh, like the combination of these things is really important and uh, at the end of the day, like top coaches, they have these 
kind of a real experience and they know when to do the right thing at the right time. That that's that's it. Not doing like oh we are going to put a couscous or burger or this strange food in your yeah. diet at this time and create this alchemy. It's just having a refit, a little bit more rice. Don't change anything. Blah blah blah. That, that's more of the same stuff. I think the secret, so like touching on what you said there, like the secret to bodybuilding is, I talked about this on a podcast I did last week, is the consistency over time plus hard work. Yeah. So it's both. It's the consistency of executing your plan and the hard work that goes into the training over long periods of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the consistency. Um you remember Dallas McCarver back when he was with BSN and he made those like videos with BSN a lot. And then remember he's sitting on his front stoop of his apartment in Tennessee. And he's talking about how he's like, anybody can have a good day of dieting. And he's like, it's the consistency of the hard work. That is what gets you the results. And like, I'm directly par paraphrasing that with my explanation because, you know, that's, he's a one, a great example of like, what just blue, blue, like blue collar work ethic looks like. Um, but also too, like that's, that is the secret. Yeah. If you want to make gains and you want to make, you want to be like, it depends because you have to determine like what you really want. Do you want to be a freak? Okay. Then you have to be really consistent for a really long period of time, yeah. you know? And even people who don't have like the greatest of genetics, if you want to be decent, you have to be consistent for really long periods of time. You have to be able to look in, you have to be able to compartmentalize and look yourself in the mirror and realize who you are yep. when it comes to that. It's like, well, who am I? Like, do I have world-class genetics? It's okay to tell, tell yourself no, because the majority of people need to be able to tell themselves that there's yep. only a handful, you know what I mean? It's the 1% of the 1% and they're on the Olympia stage every year. So, you know, their names. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's not a secret of who they are. And it's that talent that we talked about before. Yeah. It's that talent that they have with thousands of hours of crafted skill yeah. and the consistency of the hard work to be able to get there that has made them who they are. And, uh, and that's the same thing goes for coaching. Um, it's consistency over long periods of time that gets you a good reputation that helps you learn and figure out what your process is. Because everyone's process is a little different when it comes to uh, fat loss phases, when it comes to peaking, when it comes to growth phases, when it comes to PED protocols, yeah. everything. Every coach has their own little bit of a style, even as similar as Matt and I coach, we still do things somewhat differently. And that's totally fine. And I have the process that works for me and he has the process that works for him. And the point of the matter is if it gets us to the same destination consistently, then they both are winning formulas. Absolutely. There's not one that's better oh, yeah. than the other. I really love so, that. Matt. But uh, keeping it simple. Yeah, absolutely. I let you go. And uh, I really... Are you sure? You don't want to keep yeah. going? No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I really let you go because uh, it's going to be hard for people in Italy to understand everything. So I want to take okay. advantage uh, to ask you to uh, do another podcast in a couple of months or something like that. To talk I would about love to. More stuff i really enjoy to to speak to you obviously yeah. and thanks a lot for everything for being here obviously i'm going to do a presentation of yourself like uh, separate uh, later in yeah Italian, yeah just to explain better to people who you are your achievement and stuff like that mm -hmm. and uh mate really a lot of uh, great stuff thank you for being yeah. here thanks a lot. of course man no thank you i really appreciate it and i also want to give you my appreciation for uh, the collaborative effort that we have going uh, with that. Andrea, you know, it's a big deal for both of us as he's one of our marquee athletes. And I just want us to continue to be able to deliver for him the best way possible. Cause Absolutely. you know, he's, he's a great guy and it's his career. And I want to make sure that I take that very seriously. It's like, let's help this guy deliver on his career to be able to look back on when he's in his fifties or sixties and say, look at the things that I did. I'm so grateful. I had those guys in my corner. Yeah, so. absolutely. It's, it's an honor for me. Really, uh, I really love yeah. this collaboration and the, the talk we are having. Uh, it's really great for me. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Man. So, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, we will uh, we'll talk soon for Andrea and all this stuff. And I'll let you know when I'm going to release the podcast. Okay, awesome. Okay.